Our reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, the first five verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day that we may hear your word, and may we live out your word now and each day. Amen. In this morning's scripture, we learn that in the beginning was the word. Now, to all of our detriment, that got me thinking. <laughs> we, as a society, put a lot of time and effort into our words. What we do, how we succeed or fail, depends largely on how we are communicating with one another. And then I got to thinking, as important as a written or spoken word is, we, the English-speaking people of the world, sure make our words ever so complicated. Let me give you some examples. There is no egg in eggplant. There is no ham in hamburger. There is no pine and no apple in a pineapple. And I don't know what is in a hot dog, but I'm, I'm relatively sure it contains no canine parts of any kind. <laughs> English muffins are not made in England. French fries were not invented in France. And I have no idea where a Milky Way candy bar comes from. <laughs> Quicksand works slowly. Boxing rings are square. Guinea pigs are neither from New Guinea, nor are they pigs. Why is it that writers write, but fingers don't fing, and grocers don't gross, and hammers don't ham? If the plural of tooth is teeth, why isn't the plural of booth beef? One goose to geese, one moose to meese. And why isn't cheese the plural of choose? If teachers taught, why don't teachers prod? If a vegetarian eats vegetables, what does a humanitarian eat? <laughs> when a house burns up, we say it burnt down. You fill in a form by filling it out. Why do our noses run and our feet smell? <laughs> why is a slim chance and a fat chance the same thing, but a wise man and a wise guy are the exact opposites? <laughs> Why is it that when I wind up a watch, it starts, but when I wind up a letter, it finishes? And why do you get in a car, on a plane, and take an Uber? Although sometimes silly, our words and the use of language is an integral and important part of our lives. And today's scripture talks about the word. And how the word is just as important and crucial to our very existence. In John's Gospel, he refers to Jesus as the Word. Now this makes sense because words and the Word of God are an integral part of society in Old Testament times. Isaac had been deceived into blessing Jacob instead of Esau, and nothing could be done to take back that word of blessing. At every stage of the creation story, we hear the phrase, and God said, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. In Jeremiah, God says, is not my word like fire, like a hammer which breaks the rocks into pieces. The concept of word is also important in the New Testament. The Greek term for word is logos. And logos not only means word, it also means reason. In Greek, these two words were closely intertwined. When Logos was used, the Word of God and the reason of God were closely connected. And this created a powerful image of God and God's Word to the world. Barclay puts it this way, John is telling us that Jesus is none other than God's creative, life-giving, light-giving Word. Jesus is the power of God which created the world and the reason of God which sustains the world. So let me read scripture again, but let's put Jesus in the forefront 
of our minds. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Jesus was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Jesus, and without Jesus, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Jesus was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. How does Jesus as the Word help us? What does that mean for our Christian living today? And how do we understand Jesus as the Word without, being, without it being complicated? Well, let's break down the verses and see what we learn. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That means that Jesus was with God from the very beginning. Now, when I was a little boy and I went to Sunday school, I was taught in Sunday school that God created the earth and that we human beings were sinful. And in an effort to love us, to help us to be faithful, God sent prophets to call us back to God, to teach us the right way. And that worked for a while. And then the people demanded kings to rule and guide us. And when the king did right in the eyes of the Lord, things were better. But if the king did evil in the eyes of the Lord, the people would again stray and move away from God. Then God sent the people judges, extraordinary individuals of God who tried to remind others of God and what God's message was about. Nothing else seemed to be working, so God sent his son to come in and save us from our sinfulness and make us one with God. I thought that way because I was taught that way. That Jesus was sent after all the other methods of teaching about God failed. I thought that for years until I learned that in the beginning was the Word. Which means that Jesus was not some last chance effort to make humanity understand what God was all about. God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, God's tremendous love for us was in place from the very beginning. Jesus was not called in. Jesus was always part of the plan, which means that God's love has always been, God's love has never diminished, and God's love will not now or ever disappear. In other words, God's love is so strong that Jesus, the one who shows us God's love, the one who lived out God's word, the one who sacrificed his very life so that we could be in a right relationship with God, the one who is still a living presence for us. That one was here in the beginning with God, and that one is God. If all that is done out of love for us, then we should understand how much each of our individual lives means to God. God our Creator, our Father, God that loves us so. All things came into being through the Word, and without the Word not one thing came into being. And why is that important for us as Christians? Because we believe that this is God's world that we are entrusted to care for all that is God's. And that God is not some distant, heartless landlord that we never see. God is intimately involved in this world. We believe that it's our sinfulness, our selfishness, our desires, our pride that leads to the corruption of God's home. We believe that as we travel along through our journey of faith, we can be so thankful for this world that God has given to us. Which means that through that love and through what God has given, it means that we can do our best when we go to work, when we play, when we act for God in the world, when we give and help and love, when we live in a way that not only makes God proud, but affords us the opportunity to appreciate and discover new responsibilities and ways to offer God our praise. That's why that's important. What has come into being in the Word was life, and in the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. On Christmas Eve last year, we learned about Jesus being the light of the world. We learned that Jesus is the light of the world because both light and Jesus reveal things. You can hide something in the dark, 
but it's harder to hide something when you shine a light upon it. We learned that Jesus and light shines. The sun has been shining in the sky for billions of years, and the sun of humankind has been shining in our lives since the very beginning. We also learned last year that the thing about light and Jesus is that light and Jesus makes things grow. In Christ we grow into likeness of God each passing day. So Jesus is the light of the world because Jesus is revealing, because the light of Christ shines, and because Christ's light empowers us to grow closer to God each day. But what about that verse today that says, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not overcome it. If Jesus is the light, then what is darkness? Well, darkness would be anything that would go against, that would be counter to the light. Evil acts, sinful ways, bad behaviors, even a lack of understanding. Our darkness is our jealousy, our ignorance, our apathy, our neutrality, our indifference, our hatred. And it's not just these things that are opposite to a life with Christ. The darkness goes out of its way to get rid of the light. We tried it when Christ walked the earth. People did their best to trap him, to discredit him, to betray him, to deny him, even to crucify him. And in the years since Jesus walked the earth, there have been dark times for the world. Times of war and uprisings. Times of sickness and plague. Times of evil people spreading darkness. Times of fear and terrorism. Times of hate and suffering. Even during our own faith journeys, whether by our actions or through no fault of our own, we have all faced dark moments. Times of grief and sickness times of despair and loneliness and fear. Each person here has faced their own world of pain. And if you put all of that together, what we discover is that light is still shining. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things came into being through Him, and the light shines in the dark. In other words, there is nothing we can do to stop God from loving us. We can't make God love us, and we can't extinguish God's light. Once upon a time, there was a man and a son who were on a train. And this train that they were riding in was full. As you would say in, in Britain, it was chock-a-block. It was crammed full of people. Old people, young people, big people, tall people, rich people, poor people, educated people, uneducated people, all riding on the train. The man in our story was in his mid to late 60s. His son that was traveling with him was in his early to mid 30s. And they're traveling on this train. And any passenger on the train could tell that the boy was just... He was just a little bit off, just a little bit different than what we would all say was normal. As they're driving in the train, the boy is jumping up and down saying, Daddy, Daddy, look at the grass. Look how green it is. Look how blue the sky is. If you look outside, you can see the tracks of the train and you can see the wheels of the train in the tracks moving slowly. Isn't that great? Now this boy's personality, his behavior, it kind of spooked the passengers a little bit because he was behaving like he was four. And the father just took it all in stride. And the passengers were starting to feel uncomfortable. And then it started to rain. And the boy got excited and he opened the window on the train and he stuck his head out and he stuck his tongue out. So he could feel, Dad, you can see the rain and you can see it falling on your tongue. Isn't this wonderful? Well, some people started to move to another part of the train. And with the window open and the rain coming in, it was, the rain was coming into the train. And it got one lady's coat all wet. And because the rain was now coming in and getting things wet, people 
more people started to move and people started to make comments about this growing man who was behaving like he was six. And, and with the excuse of her coat being wet, the lady decided to speak up. And she said to the man, she said, I understand that your son is special and different, but it doesn't give him any right to ruin our train journey. Maybe you need to go home and take him to a hospital that can help with special people his age. And the man's first reaction was one of anger, but he decided not to give in to that, so he took a deep breath and he smiled and he said to the lady, funny you should say that, we just came from a hospital. My son just had an operation a week ago and we're returning home. And some of you are with me already in this story. We, we are returning home for the first time a week ago, for the first time in his 32 years of life, he had an operation that gave him sight. And you are experienced with him, everything that he is seeing for the first time in his life. What would we do if we had made that mistake and we were the ones that spoke up that day? How wonderful would it not have been if we had been on that train and we got to share the joy of someone whose life was a world of darkness and then suddenly saw the light. How lucky are we that God doesn't see and judge us by the darkness in our lives. How blessed are we that every day God's eyes are fresh new eyes seeing us with those fresh eyes for the first time every day of our lives and how special are we that we can be called to do the same. <coughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us. Help us to see what you see. And then help us to live as you want us to live. Now and always. Amen. Let us continue our...